Uh, hello, everybody. This is Steve Swaffer. I'm the Executive Director with No-Till on the Plains. I want to welcome you to our webinar today. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, today, we're, we have the benefit and the pleasure of having uh, six members of the National Soil Health Team with NRCS. Uh, these are regional soil health specialists, and they're going to introduce themselves to you in just a second. Uh, we put together a, a set of questions uh, that was submitted by producers uh, for these folks, and we'll ask each one of them to answer the questions in, a, in the order when we call on them. Uh, but uh, with that, uh, I want to get started with uh, the introductions. And so uh, if you would start with the introductions for us, Barry. Hi, I'm Barry Fisher. I'm originally from Indiana. Uh, spent most of my career in Indiana working with no-till and cover crops and soil health management systems for 38 years. So I might be the senior member on this on this call, but uh, uh, the states that I cover as a soil health specialist is it started as Indiana and Illinois, but with some retirements, I, I now also cover uh, Michigan, uh, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So right now we're, we're, I'm trying to serve as point of contact for a, a lot of the Eastern Corn Belt. And, uh, uh, but uh, it's great experience working with those states in those areas. And there's some ph phenomenal producers that I get to work with. That's the greatest joy of the job. I also have a really good team in the central that I'm team leader for and, and, and Candy Thomas, Doug Peterson, and Stan Bolts that's on this call uh, are, are part of that team. And then, of course, I get to work a lot with Marlon and Willie, who are also on this call. So glad to be a part of this. Thanks, Barry. Uh, Doug, would you please introduce yourself? You bet, Steve. I'm Doug Peterson. I'm the uh, soil health, the regional soil health specialist covering uh, Missouri and Iowa officially, um, like a lot of other uh, of our specialists, we end up covering a lot of other activities in other states as well. Um, spent spent most of my career here in Missouri. Um, grew up on a, a row crop and livestock farm here in Missouri. Um, you know, been with NRCS for, I guess, going on 32 years. So not as many as Barry. He's been around forever. But um, uh, been in cropland counties in North Missouri, um, row crop, row crops uh, in grassland counties in Southern Missouri, um, state, state soil health specialist, and then regional soil health specialist. And again, just uh, great opportunities to work with producers all over the, all over the Midwest um, on a variety of uh, uh, soil health, soil health uh, practices and activities, including grassland and cropland. All right, thanks. Candy, please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Candy Thomas, Regional Soil Health Specialist for Kansas, Nebraska, and starting May the 9th after Rudy Garcia retires, I'll have Colorado. Um, I've been working for NRCS for around 26 years, and uh, before that I, I worked as a training specialist with the National Employee Development Center within our agency training new employees. Um, and then I worked for many years in Missouri, about 16 years in Missouri as a DC um, soil con and um, resource conservationist. And thank you for having me. Thanks, Candy. All right, uh, Stan, please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Stan Bolt, uh, regional soil health specialist. I cover North Dakota and South Dakota. I often just call it Dakota, or one, I guess, up here. Um, and uh, I started out, or I've been a range management specialist most of my career. I've been with NRCS uh, going on 33 years now uh, and here in a couple months. And uh, started out in Nevada, was out there for 10 years. And then I came to South Dakota and I eventually became the state range management specialist. And uh, pretty recently became the regional soil health specialist for Dakota. So. All right, thanks, Dan. And Willie. Uh, I'm Willie Durham. I reside in Texas, Temple, Texas, and uh, I cover Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, and soon to be New Mexico. I'm already working some there, uh, just waiting for uh, 
Rudy's retirement and uh, primarily I joined NRCS back in 2002 as a conservation agronomist, uh, moved into a district conservationist position and resource team leader position, uh, eventually became state agronomist for Texas for several years and then I joined the uh, soil health division in 2015 as a regional soil health specialist. Thanks. Thanks, Willie. Um, so uh, last introduction is, is going to be Marlon. And uh, after he introduces himself, he's going to take us through uh, a short presentation on the principles of soil health. So while Marlon is introducing himself, I'm going to pull this up uh, on his uh, slides and share the screen. So go ahead, Marlon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Marlon Winger, I received my bachelor's and master's degree at Utah State University in plant science. I grew up on a family owned dairy farm in southeastern Idaho and I just loved agriculture and it soon became my passion. I worked as a county, ex county agricultural extension agent for Utah State University for about nine years in Price, Utah. And from there I moved on to working with the Natural Resource Conservation Service as an area agronomist in Northern Utah. Then I moved up to a state agronomist in Idaho, working in Boise area for about seven years. And like the rest of the specialists, I uh, joined the Regional Soil Health Specialist Team in 2015. My area coverage is Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. And uh, with our good friend Rudy retiring, uh, I'm going to be working in Utah a little bit. I live on a little ranchette in Casper, Wyoming with my family. And my wife chases me out of the house to take care of some sheep and hogs and a few calves and a large garden. So. All right. I'm, I'm trying to overcome my own technical challenges here. Uh, uh, we should have it here in just a second, Marlon. All right. So go ahead, Marlon. Well, welcome everybody again. Uh, we just wanted to break the ice a little bit to, to get this webinar started. And we thought just a quick discussion, a little lecture about the core principles of soil health. <clears throat> the last couple of years, I've heard uh, several speakers uh, talk of these principles as the principles of nature, and I really kind of like that concept. Uh, I, I personally believe that a lot of the answers to many of our agricultural resource concerns are contained in this graphic, and I think you'll see many of the answers in today's webinar will contain comments about these principles. Uh, as in my introduction, you know I work mostly in the western States and so livestock integration has become an important tool for us to enhance all of these principles. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've seen large sugar beet producers over the last couple of years bring in large bands of sheep to graze the nematode resistant cover crops late in the fall. And potato growers like Brendan Rocky in Colorado now bringing in cattle for say 30 days to graze full season cover crops. Or what's even fun is to see some Idaho dryland wheat growers uh, grazing broiler chickens on small acreage of cover crops. It's a good example of doing a little direct marketing uh, on their produce. Well, let's go to the next slide, Steve, and we'll uh, dive into these just a little bit further. The first two principles focus on the protection of the soil habitat, minimizing disturbance and maximizing soil cover. When I teach, I personally like to use the word armor. It reminds me to be more proactive and to be protective. This armor, of course, maintains or increases stable soil aggregates and soil organic matter and protects the fragile surface of the soil that is most susceptible to the degrading forces of wind and water. Of course, covering the soil also buffers against extreme swings in temperature that stresses plants and soil organisms and reduces evaporation rate. I love Dr. Beck's comments from South Dakota that we need to learn to take E out of ET. <clears throat> it's always fun to talk about this in a course, but of course he means that E is the evaporation of that equation. These two principles can also increase water use efficiency. In the West, we are now learning 
the value of long stem, long stem straw to catch a little of our neighbor's blowing straw, blowing snow. Soil organic matter is highest at the soil surface and is, and is critical for stabilizing soil aggregates. Maintaining soil organic matter helps support additional soil functions, including water infiltration and storage, nutrient holding capacity and releases, nutrient holding capacity and release and habitat for soil, soil microbes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the second two principles focus on feeding the organisms inhabiting the soil, maximizing the diversity of food, energy and carbon inputs, and above ground biodiversity through increased plants like cover crops and diverse crop rotations and animal and soil amendments in and soil amendments increase the diversity of soil animals microorganisms and activities diversity not only refer, refers to food sources but also above ground diversification of plants and animals as well as microbial diversification underground diversification stimulates a host of additional benefits including breaking disease cycles providing habitat for pollinators wildlife and beneficial predators and stimulating plant growth. I believe that we as producers need to focus on a net carbon gain in our soil ecosystems. One of my professional heroes, Jay Fuhrer, has taught for decades that if you want to build carbon levels in the soil, you have to simply put in more than you take or lose. Next slide. <clears throat> Just in the a few closing comments from an article of uh, R.M. Lehman. On the left-hand side of the table, uh, we list a few management types that tend to reduce soil health, or you could say soil function. The right-hand side tends to promote soil health. Now, I'm not saying you have to do all these uh, items to be successful, but they can be looked at as management choices. On the left, it's easy to see aggressive tillage generally reduces soil health compared to no-till or reduced till. Uh, annual, annual seasonal fallow compared to cover crops whenever possible or intercropping or relay cropping will help promote soil health. Of course, monocropping compared to diverse crop rotations. Annual crops compared to perennial crops. In Idaho, for example, some of our best sugar beet yields follow perennial crops like alfalfa when they're in the rotation. Excessive inorganic fertilizer use can reduce, have a tend to reduce soil health, but we can improve that by reducing inorganic fertilizer or, or increased carbon-based fertilizers. <clears throat> Some of our dry land farmers in the West, one neighbor will, they're both harvesting 40 bushel dry land wheat, but one bales his straw, the other shreds it with his combine and leaves it on the ground. Broad spectrum fumigants and pesticides can tend to reduce soil health, whereas integrating integrated pest management can certainly help. Excessive use of herbicides compared to reduced use of herbicides to promote soil health. Steve, that's just a, a few thoughts that uh, I come up with, so we'll turn the time back to you. Okay. Well, again, I want to remind everybody uh, the questions that I'm going to pose to these uh, regional soil health specialists that are part of the, the National Soil Health Team of NRCS were submitted by producers. We solicited a number of producers to, to stump the panel, so to speak. And so uh, we're going to we're going to start and we're going to spend about the next 50 minutes uh, asking the questions. And uh, we we probably won't get through all the questions that were submitted, uh, but we're going to uh, forge ahead and, and uh, share some knowledge with all of you out there. So we're going to start this first question and pose that to Doug Peterson. Uh, Doug, if there was one thing to measure uh, as a gauge to changes in soil health, what would that be for you? Well, Steve, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it's probably probably fitting that we start off with it. It's probably the the most common question that most of us get asked. You know, is how do we measure it? 
there's a lot of things you can measure. You can measure organic matter. You can measure fungal to bacterial ratios. You can measure aggregation. There's a, there's a ton of things you can measure. Um, but for me, it, it basically comes down to, to one thing, and that's water. Um, you know, water, does it, does it soak in? Um, does it evaporate off quickly? Uh, is there enough to grow a crop? Um, you know, in the big picture, water drives everything. The soil is really considered an, an aquatic environment. The biology that we all talk about, you know, they need water to, to move and function in. Um, you know, they're not like, I mean, the insects, there's some insects and some earthworms that can move around on their own, but for, for the most part, they're, they're swimmers. It's a swimming uh, activity that they do to move around, and so they've got to have liquid. And, and so, you know, having good, having good water, a film of water in and on uh, around those aggregates in the soil is where they move through. You know, so does the water infiltrate, uh, allowing good habitat for biology? Um, does, it, does it soak in? You know, if the water infiltrates fast, then, <clears throat> then we've probably got pretty good aggregation going on. Um, you know, if the water infiltrates uh, and, and, then, and then transpires as it comes back out slowly uh, through a plant as opposed to evaporating, we're probably getting good plant growth. Um, you know, it's gonna, uh, good infiltration is gonna re reduce off-site flooding. It's going to, <clears throat> it's going to uh, reduce the effects of droughts. Um, you know, and I think, I think even over time, as we get that water to transpire more, more slowly coming out of plants as opposed to quick evaporation or quick runoff, I think it's gonna change even the, the intensity and the duration of our rainfall events. You know, they're beginning to, to tie that, land, tie land use to uh, weather events. So I think ultimately it comes down to the water cycle, Steve. Um, water cycle drives everything. All right, Doug, thanks. Arlen, anything you'd want to add to Doug's answer there? Well, I, I surely agree with, uh, with Doug's comments. I, I took it just a little different. Uh, in my opinion, a shovel is a great way to look at the soil profile. And when you're looking at the profile, you're looking for granular structure. You're looking for signs of platy soil or compaction zones. You're looking at root formation and all those things affect uh, water infiltration. Of course, when you see good granular structure, it's a good sign that you have a good, strong, strong, healthy aggregate. Because <clears throat> if you don't have a good aggregate, the water cycle seems to fall apart, right? I think another tool that I really love to use is an infiltration ring. It's a good way to measure the water cycle. And it gives you a few minutes to talk with producers or colleagues about that water cycle. That aggregate stability and water infiltration all start coming together as the soil regains their ability to function. So just a few comments. Thanks, Marlon. All right, so our next question, we're gonna start with Stan for the answer. So uh, what are the benefits to soil biology of a multi-species cover crop over a single species cover crop? So I, I guess I answered that question kind of with an example of something I experienced. And in 2006, I was on a bus tour. We went up to uh, Burley County up in North Dakota uh, by, by Bismarck. Um, 2006, uh, you're probably not familiar, but that was a severe drought year for a lot of those counties along the Missouri River. Anyway, we went to the uh, Burley County Conservation District. They had planted a, a large number of plots that year of cover crops. Most of them were single species cover crops. Um, at the end of the row, they kind of, they had some leftover seed, I think, really. And they, they planted some uh, cocktail mixes, if you will, co uh, diverse mixes of cover crops at the end. And so when we went on this bus tour, we, we piled out of the bus and looked at these plots and it, was, it looked like a total failure because all the single species plots were, were dead, uh, brown, crispy, and then we got to the end over there and we thought maybe they had watered those plots, <laughs> but the, the multi-species plots were green, they were productive, they were thriving. And uh, it, that really hit me at that time that there's something going on when you have that diversity, those plants are helping each other. And uh, 
so apparently there's a benefit from having uh, multi-species uh, uh, cover crops versus single species or fewer species and uh, and you could see it that year in that drought year. Great. Uh, Candy, what would you add to that? Well, um, I, I thought, well, I'll look up and see if I can, and actually I just read a paper um, the other day that just came through the mails, brand new research from, uh, actually from China by Kim um, in that Soil Biology and Biochemistry Journal, and they looked at that um, relationship between the different uh, multi-cover species, cover crops versus single species, and um, what they found was, and, and I mean, we've even found this, that, that you have to interpret that really carefully because the fact that uh, as landowners and, you know, just as practitioners ourselves, we can't really determine that abundance and that diversity of those different types of, of uh, species within a, in a soil sample because we don't really have the ability to run like DNA analysis to look at those different species types. But we do see, and I mean, I'd, we had a uh, two producer workshops, one at Michael Thompson's, one at Bryce Custer, where we compared, um, you know, under different different management systems, whether it be um, cover crops and um, grazing or no cover crops and then the tillage. Under each one of those, when we, we grew those soils underneath the microscope, we saw a lot of differences and that underneath those more diverse systems that had more diversity in the cover crop species, we got more diversity in the different types of species we found in there. We found nematodes, we found um, that fungi was growing over two weeks period of time. We had a lot of different protozoa types and the bacteria was all different um, compared to the tilled system, which you know was just primarily dominated by bacteria, period. A few protozoa, not very many. Um, but what they said in their research uh, was very similar to that. But um, the one thing that they found, and of course that's the problem with all research, is that they, you know, trying to compare all of these different types of, of research uh, between different uh, field assays and whatnot, that there's relationships are there, but that it's, you know, the sameness from one plot to the next is completely different um, as it would be, you know, we as humans are completely different from one human to the next, but that the ag practices that they looked at um, and the, the way the cover crop was terminated, um, so those, those crops that were terminated by chemical uh, termination, um, had different types of species compared to those those cover crops that were say either tillage or rolled um, and then of course climate and soil type and those are the two things that we really have no control over you know our climate the amount of rainfall we get when we get that rainfall um, our soil types are all different whether we have silty loams um, versus clay or really heavy sands um, that don't have nearly as much diversity but um, those are the two things we can control is that tillage method uh, or the tillage, the amount of tillage that we do do by minimizing tillage. And Marlon talked about that in the beginning, um, you know, keeping that, that, uh, that living root there as a food source. And then the cover, having a good, a good place for these microbes to live, you got to have that habitat. And but doing that, you have to eliminate tillage to build that habitat. So like building a house. Um, that those are the two things we can control and the way we terminate it. Um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell from, from my standpoint, because I've seen a lot of different things under, you know, different, different systems by growing these, these petri dish plates of, of different microorganisms. And I know, Steve, you've seen it even underneath your compost pile when we looked at that, just that huge amount of, of carbon input there does change things quite a bit similar to what Stan said. Thanks, Candy. So uh, we're going to pose this next question and start off with Barry. Um, what data or metrics do you gather to, or suggest to gather to establish a, a dollar figure to determine how cover crops directly or indirectly equals to improve soil capacity? Well, of course, the dollar figure is the is the outlier because it has to do with your entire management system. However, if you're starting to measure your system, your 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 management system, and you want to start measuring, collecting data, and, and find something that's going to tie to productivity, potential, and resilience, 
you know, we've got to be able to grow a crop, whatever the weather gives us. And so resilience is a word that we use a lot. Uh, so if I'm going to be measuring soil and looking for data collection, I'm going to, I'm going to be looking at aggregate stability. It tells us a lot. And, and almost everybody before on the other questions has alluded to aggregate stability as it's, as it controls so much of the water cycle, it controls so much of the nutrient cycle and growing crops is all about uh, providing water and providing nutrients to that plant. And if the soil can't provide its share because of poor aggregate stability, then, then uh, you're, you're gonna uh, struggle, you know, from a resilience standpoint, but really from, from productivity standpoint in general. So, so I, I wanna, uh, always measure aggregate stability and I think I think farmers need to really be become that needs to be one of their skill sets that they're going out and they're checking their own aggregate stability and they're monitoring it and if, if it's improving in all likelihood that means we're getting better water infiltration we're getting making water more available where and if we get that happening the microbes are going to do well the microbes are going to supply nutrients we're going to cycle nutrients throughout a wider range of, of weather conditions and if that happens we grow better crops and that turns into dollars uh, time and time again. One new technology that we've used a lot, you know, now that we've got the ability to put moisture probes in the soil and download those, I mean, we can link those right up with our phone. One thing that we found in a lot of our plot work is we've had moisture probes uh, in the ground on, on side by side plots. And, and we find that, you know, there's a direct correlation where we're building active carbon, we're generally building aggregate stability, but we're building it. If we've got a building, we're, we're able to show building active carbon and we're building and we're showing building aggregate stability. Those probes in those, those scenarios are holding water longer. We're keeping moisture in the profile longer. But the amazing thing is we're showing that with these probes, we can monitor from what level in the soil the roots are actually drawing water from. And what we're finding is where we've got good soil health, good aggregate stability, good, good active carbon pools, uh, good active organic matter pools, where these crops are drawing moisture through uh, a much deeper part of the profile. And so that really adds to our resilience and capabilities too. So we can use a lot of new technologies that are available to us right now. But I'll tell you what, the first thing that most farmers could do is start monitoring their aggregate stability. They'll know then if they're following those four principles, they're no, they'll know then if their soil is moving, soil health is moving in the right direction. And they'll, they'll, they'll enjoy those benefits from improved soil functions and resilience. Thanks, Barry. Marlon, anything you want to add to that? Oh, I think Barry covered it very well. I, I love a shovel and an infiltration ring because that's helping me measure the water cycle and that aggregate stability. If you have poor aggregate stability, you're going to have low infiltration. And that's what an infiltration ring will show you. Also, NRCS in most states and at the national level, we've developed various cropland soil health assessment forms. And th those are really good activities to use. Uh, those assessment forms, they look at many soil health indicators and you can see where you where you need to make improvements based on those assessments, so. Right, thanks. All right, that we're gonna. So, that infield Go soil health assessment is also uh, being developed on a, on, a, on a phone app too. So it's gonna be a really nice handheld tool that most farmers have on them at all times. Just wanted to throw that in. Good. Really good. All right, we're going to throw one now towards Willie's way. Um, what's the biggest loss that producers experience when they work their no-till ground for weed control once or twice, thinking it's a, a cost savings, and then they try to go back to no-till? You're on mute, Willie. Still on mute. Hit your space bar. Okay, now can you hear me? There you go. Okay. Uh, I think the biggest loss to these types of uh, ag systems and cropping systems is that we move the whole ecological system that you have already built to that point by doing no-till, cover crops, crop rotation, 
all those different things. Uh, through the use of tillage, what has happened is that you now move that uh, system back to the first stage of ecological succession. And so it's, it's kind of better to maintain the current system that you have than it is to till or to push that ecological successional stage uh, back uh, because once you eliminate that uh, that system through the use of tillage where you destroy a structure and you create a condition where you have high amounts of nitrate, these different things, that supports weeds. And you lose all that you've built up in that soil system up to that point. So it's really not advantageous to you to, uh, to do that. And also, uh, one of the things that happens because of those particular actions, your primary forms of nitrogen and stuff are in the nitrate form uh, in that system, uh, which is not used efficiently. Uh, just an example, if you have corn out there, corn plant out there, it takes 16% total uh, photosynthate to convert that nitrate into an amino acid or protein. So it's very important to understand the, the forms of nitrogen that are in your system. A lot of that is, is dictated by the types of microorganisms that are there in those communities that you have built up. And uh, also when you have nitrate in your system, uh, your uh, crop is going to be requiring approximately, especially corn will require three times more water uh, because nitrate has to be uh, translocated up to the leaf. And then when it's transformed into an amino acid, you lose that water to transpiration. And then the plant continues to pick up uh, nitrate in that way. So, uh, best thing is to defer to Candy and let her explain all the specifics uh, that you know come with uh, you know uh, tilling the soil and thinking that you're saving money because uh, uh, I know she can list all the different types of things that uh, that tend to go wrong or tend to start over uh, in that system. Candy, you want to? Uh, yeah. Give us more I, just when reading your question, you asked what the biggest loss was. For me, I think that biggest loss was that active carbon, that labile carbon that Barry alluded to. Um, and it, immediately that gets hosed when you when you till that soil along with any hyphal connections that you had created um, that our muscular mycorrhizae made. Um, you also have mineralized any of that, if you didn't have a lot of labile carbon there, some of that stable carbon because you just added oxygen to that soil matrix, you stirred it up and start spark this feeding frenzy of bacteria, which starts to work on that soil organic matter. So you're losing organic matter, um, you know, possibly in that very first time. But the most important thing that you're losing um, by doing this tillage is, is that aggregate stability that we kind of have discussed as being one of those key indicators. Um, once you resize those aggregates, you can't really size them back together other than having more plant roots in the system, um, you know, more root exudates so that you get that feeding and, and those, those soil glues to hold all those aggregates back together. Then you start seeing that you know, aggregate breakdown um, where you have some bare areas from doing that bit of tillage, you're going to see what Barry calls his vertical erosion, dispersion of those, those soils, surface sealing and crusting. Um, and if you're west of the 100th meridian, that can be, you know, highly detrimental because then you've just eliminated all your, your water infiltration that you, what you um, had created. At about two and a half percent organic matter, that can become if it's above that, you, you may not see as much, but I think more like three to 4% organic matter, you might be able to get away with doing a little bit of tillage. But what did you do for the weeds? Really nothing. You just re reintroduced weed seed that's broken dormancy now because it got light. It gets those three things, light, water, and uh, uh, you know nutrients in the space in order for it to grow. Uh, so you broke dormancy with some of that. Um, you, in the case of Palmer amaranth, which can germinate with an increase of temperature up or down by just one degree, there's over a million seeds per plant that has that potential now to, you know, grow and turn into to uh, into new, you know, baby Palmer out there. And if you keep, you know, follow our principles, keep the soil covered, the the, the biggest potential for reducing um, weed. Uh, infestation is by growing biomass of some sort. That biomass is the only competition for weeds. 
Um, it goes right back to, you know, that ecological succession or those early root rules that come in are, are the ones that are trying to keep the ground covered. So if we keep the ground covered and we can grow some biomass, and I know K-State did a little bit of research and they showed that for every, every um, uh, 900 pounds of biomass that we can grow and, and Stan can probably talk about biomass when you get to the, the grazing section. Um, which is not very much. You can get around a, you know, a four percent decrease in weed infestation, which is, you know, pretty, pretty great when you think about it. You know, just growing a plant, you can reduce the amount of weed infestation. Um, so, to me, I don't think that tillage is not a uh, even a one-pass system, as it's called, by uh, some of our our uh, researchers that that felt like it was okay. I think there's too much damage and there's too much offsite, um, you know. Uh, impact in the end. Great. We're going to go back to Barry now. Um, what are the effects of synthetic nitrogen applications to soil biology, those, those biological uh, uh, organisms that we rely on so much to create that infiltration and in soil aggregation? How are they affected by synthetic nitrogen? Well, <clears throat> Large doses of any fertilizer application or nutrient application become, can become a chemical disturbance. And, it, and the bottom line is, uh, if, if we put these large single doses on at one time, we'll ramp up certain forms of biology that, that want to eat the other forms. And, and particularly, you're going to ramp up the, the bacterial populations those bacterial populations will explode. And we can measure this, uh, you know, by a huge increase in, in CO2 emissions. And that's just basically measuring the respiration of all those microbes going crazy with this new food source. Well, when they eat their self out of house and home, they're immediately going to need some carbon to go with that, that new nitrogen to make, to make protein, to make, you know, their, their new population. So the easiest carbon to go looking for, unfortunately, are some of the most beneficial carbon, labile carbon compounds that are in the soil that are produced by other microbes. And so, you know, some of those, uh, you know, uh, the, the sugars, the glues, they call them the biological glues, they're easily accessible carbon sources for, for that new population, and they're going to eat that. And when they, when they start eating those, those products, then our aggregate stability starts breaking down, our nutrient cycling breaks down, we have this ripple effect that, that is caused by this large single dose. And, and it, it's just a matter of these microbes, are there. there's a lot of them down there and they're gonna be hungry and, and uh, they're gonna keep eating until they run out of food. And, and we don't want them to go looking for the beneficial compounds in our soil. And so spoon feeding crops is your first, is your first uh, uh, strategy, you know. If, if you're going to apply fertilizer, apply it as the crop needs it. Try to try to put it in a dosing, like a, you know, spoon feed that crop as best you can. That way, you're not pro providing this huge explosion uh, of of um, you know bacterial biomass that's got to have something to eat someplace. And and so that's that's probably the biggest single detriment that happens, and it happens really fast. We see this it's very easy to 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 watch and very easy to measure with just by checking, you know, the, the CO2 release, you know, it's the it's respirations, what that's coming from. That's our carbon leaving the soil though. And when we have a lot of CO2 respiration that we're measuring. Okay. Willie, anything you want to add to that? Uh, just to add to uh, what uh, Barry was talking about, you know, many times these large applications of synthetic nitrogen and and even phosphorus, they're very detrimental to some of the uh, uh, biology that's beneficial in the soil, such as nitrogen fixing bacteria, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, and uh, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, actually, nitrogen you know, fixation as we transition to a soil health management system, nitrogen fixation is a spontaneous process in the soil when adequate carbon is available you know, from plants. When we use large doses of, of, say, phosphorus as an example, uh, your plants do not produce strigolactone. And then, so these, that's a root growth hormone. It allows the association with mycorrhizal fungi, so you don't get that association with these 
beneficial types of organisms. And the uh, prefixing, you know, nitrogen bacteria, uh, we tend to, to call these, uh, you know, uh, associative diazotropes. Uh, associative because they're, they're only found inside of aggregates. And that's that habitat that Barry, you know, just mentioned when you look at the roots, when you pick them up and you have these associations, you've got those aggregates there. Understand that this is where those prefixing nitrogen bacteria, that's their habitat, that's where they are, uh, because they have to have that, that, um, that aggregate there, and they're attached, of course, to those living roots, and they're connected via the, the hyphae, because they're actually being fed carbon, either by the plant or through, through the mycorrhizal fungi. And so um, the reason they have to be inside of an aggregate is because of their ability uh, to use the nitrogenase enzyme, you can't have a lot of oxygen there for that enzyme to function. So uh, they're found within aggregates because they require low partial pressure of oxygen so that the nitrogenase enzyme can fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere. And that's a little bit different from a legume. A legume forms a nodule so that it can do that, so it can limit the amount of oxygen so the nitrogenase enzyme will work. So essentially what we're doing is as we're transitioning to a soil health management system, we have to understand the importance of all this, uh, this important beneficial biology because they're, they're helping us to cycle more nutrients, they're helping us to fix nitrogen, they're helping us to phosphorus, uh, solubilize phosphorus. And then in all, the mycorrhizal fungi helps us fill humic substances in the soil. That's how we build organic matter. So all these things are very important. Just don't uh, understand that we can't uh, go out there and, and use large doses of, of the inorganic synthetic fertilizer because you're going to have the impact on the biological system. Okay. Well, we, we just talked about inorganic fertilizer. Let's let's talk about uh, a, a more organic uh, form of fer fertilizer and ask Doug, um, are, are large applications of manure once every five to 10 years better than smaller yearly applications? Well, Steve, I think it's kind of the same, <clears throat> the same answer that, that, that Barry and Willie talked about from from uh, inorganic fertilizers, you know, um, that that soil, the, the soil and the biology and the nutrient holding capacity, it kind of develops an, an equilibrium uh, of how much how much biology is in the soil, how much nutrients it can hold. And when you when you dump a big dose of, of anything on it, whether it be even even, you know, uh, fertility fertilizer, um, whether it be manure of some kind, it, it really disrupts that equilibrium of the organisms of the nutrients in the soil. And, and so, you know, those, when we, when we disrupt that equilibrium, as Barry mentioned, it just, it just throws everything into chaos. And so uh, I think there's a lot more opportunity for loss, for nutrient loss, when we dump those big amounts of manure on there. Um, it's just it's just a much bigger disturbance. You know the same things. I think the same thing applies to to manure as to as to any other disturbance, um, whether it be whether it be tillage, whether it be uh, fertilizer, whether it be chemicals, anything that we do that upsets the the the, the stable uh, equilibrium of that uh, soil biology system. Um, it just it can cause all kinds of problems. That's great. Uh, for several of you have uh, uh, in your states, you're, you're in large states and you have uh, semi-arid regions uh, of your state that you're, you're having to talk to producers about how they deal with limited water. Um, and one of the questions about uh, those semi-arid uh, regions is how to increase worm populations in, in that kind of environment. And uh, are worms actually detrimental in a limited rainfall environment because they cycle too much residue. So Stan, why don't you take that one to start with? So with a lot of these things, I come at it from a rangeland perspective, I guess that's my background. Um, and so sometimes with, with indicators and biology is, is kind of one of them. They, we look at things a little differently on rangeland versus cropland. 
this happens to be one of those, at least from, from my experience. Um, as you probably know, many species of earthworms are not uh, apparently native. And on healthy, uh, diverse, uh, native dominated rangeland earthworms, we often don't even see them. Um, and I believe it's probably uh, due to a diverse population of insects, which some of which may be predatory actually to earthworms. So I, I can't speak to whether or not they're actually detrimental, but uh, when, when we typically see earthworms on rangeland, it's on uh, degraded rangeland, and, and oftentimes it's when we have an uh, uh, influx of, of uh, non-native uh, invasive cool season species like Kentucky bluegrass and smooth chrome. That's usually when we see the earthworms, but on, on our native, uh, very diverse uh, rangeland communities, we just don't, we don't see very many earthworms, but that's kind of looking at that from the rangeland perspective. Candy, how about in, in Nebraska and, and Kansas out in the western parts of those states? What do you well, think as far as earthworms? I, I, earthworms aren't always in every, like uh, Stan said, they're not always in every ecosystem. And I don't know if I'd be necessarily too concerned about, you know, having earthworms versus not having earthworms. I, I would be concerned if you didn't have any, what we call ecosystem engineers, those um, larger uh, organisms that create good pore space and, and of those earthworms is one, but ants and termites. And I know um, Stan said that in, uh, they do find in native rangeland a lot of ants. Um, they're also very good and beneficial and in, in a lot of the semi-arid parts of the west and even arid parts you'll find ants in those ecosystems. Um, earthworms don't survive or live very well in sandy or you know type of soils because of their their skin. It, it, it's an irritant to their, their skin in that way. Um, but also uh, if you do have the ants and the, and the termites and whatever, you know, and even the earthworms um, using a lot, you know, broad spectrum type of insecticides can be pretty risky because um, you can lose quite a few of those ecosystem engineers. Um, even in native rangeland, you know, broad spectrum mowing with a, with a big, uh, with a big uh, brush hog can take out a lot of those ant, ant, ant mounds. Um, some people don't like them, but um, they do serve a, a really good purpose. And they're um, usually, if you do have ants, they're a good indicator of soil water, um, just like the earthworms are. Um, if something that can happen, like you did mention, that could be detrimental out in the West is uh, if you do get the earthworms out in some of those, you know, uh, silty clay loams, is uh, that residue feeding. Uh, if we start losing residue in the West, we're subject to, you know, aggregate breakdown, and then we get blowing and and uh, uh, deposition of sand, uh, silts in, in other people's fields. Um, so you do have to be a bit careful, and you're going to have to provide quite a bit of a food source for them. Um, keeping something there and keeping the ground covered all the time if you are getting, you know, big earthworm population. 20 earthworms per square foot is found just under strictly no-till, but if you have no-till and cover crops, um, that number can jump up. And if you're just thinking a square foot and you've got over, you know, 60 to 70 earthworms in that small area, they need food. So they're going to use that... Uh, residue on the surface as bait um, for other potential feed uh, in the way of bacteria and fungi. So, you know, you got to be pretty careful. If you do have them, you're going to have to provide them a lot of food. So that's, that's the one disruptor I can see that be from them. But I wouldn't be concerned if you have ants. There's nothing wrong with ants in the no-till system. All right. So the next question uh, is kind of two parts to it and, and uh, addresses uh, reducing nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, so I'm going to ask Barry to answer the first part, and then I'll, I'll read the second part and ask uh, Willie to, to answer that part. Um, so Barry, uh, at what point can producers uh, provide crop nutrient needs without commercial fertilizers, and, and how do they actually go about determining that point at which they can cut back or, or really start to uh, reduce that amount of fertilizer that they're using? Well, we always recommend for everybody that, that uh, you need to do some, some of your own on-farm field trials, do some testing, set up some plots, 
try different rates. Uh, everybody starts into this system at a different place from a nutrient standpoint and from a biological standpoint, and both have to provide and so, uh, cycle nutrients to the crop. So you kind of need to, before you just jump in, you have to kind of know where you're at, both from a soil health, soil function standpoint and biology standpoint, and from your inherent, what, what, what are your current fertility levels? So it's, it's always advisable that everybody start by, by doing some field trials, you know, just see what's going to happen. Job one in this entire system is have a system in place that keeps nutrients on the land. You know, if you, you know that's step one before you start cutting fertilizer, you've got to, you've got to make sure that you're adequately cycling nutrients, keeping them on the land and have a system in place for that. But you're going to have to monitor this on your own farm. Do some, do some field plots. Nobody wants a train wreck and, and we certainly don't want anybody to have a train wreck. Your soil may not be ready to do the cycling and carry the load that, that it needs to still produce a viable crop. So, so get things in place, start working on those four principles and uh, but but start start doing some side by side trials. Measure things. We got great capabilities to measure. Uh, uh, put out some plots and t take some of our own results on our own land. Yeah, that's, that's great advice for everybody to, to look at what's going on in your own soils. Uh, so kind of related to that, Willie, we've still got lots of folks who are doing a good job, uh, are using using cover crops and, and getting some good results with cover crops, but they're still struggling to get uh, to the point where they don't need uh, starter fertilizer and even uh, using some fertilizer with their cover crops and their cash crops. And what steps might you recommend for them to take in order to gradually cut back on that fertilizer? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, the biggest thing is to follow up on what Barry just mentioned. And, you know, we have to be able to follow those principles of soil health. And you have to continue to till. If you continue to till, you have fallow ground, you use heavy synthetics, inorganic fertilizers, uh, there's going to be limited, uh, you're going to be limited on the reduction, you know, as far as the fertility is concerned. So you got to get a cropping system that follows these principles and that's one which you're doing no-till, good crop rotation, cover crops. And then the, that's the closer you get to this zero fertility. And there's several examples of that with uh, Dave Brandt in Ohio, Gabe Brown in North Dakota. Uh, but one of the things that you can do is you're transitioning these systems and you are using these synthetic fertilizers is that you can stabilize those particular nitrogen applications and phosphorus applications. Uh, there's there's a lot more uh, people that are trying to make the fertilizers and stuff what I would like to call biologically friendly. And, and the way to do that is to implement some certain things to make that happen. And that is, uh, you know, based on soil tests, make sure you're doing your soil testing, uh, make sure that you have a uh, uh, nitrogen to sulfur ratio of about 10 to one. Uh, the reason that you're doing this is because uh, the purpose of providing sulfur in those ratios is to quickly convert nitrogen to microbial amino acids, okay, in that system. Uh, also, uh, you want to possibly start using uh, humic acid products uh, with your fertilizer. Uh, there's uh, chemically extracted type products. Uh, there's also uh, some new products that are coming out that are micronized products in which they mechanically grind down uh, the uh, lenardite or humolite uh, type uh, materials, uh, but the purpose in using those with your nitrogen application, uh, the purpose is to complex and stabilize uh, with concentrated and stable carbon, which that's what the humic acid is, and it gives you a better, larger holding capacity when you put that into the soil. So one of the keys there is, is that uh, if you're able to hold that synthetic fertilizer nitrogen in that soil, uh, then it stands to reason that through the use of that product, you don't have to use quite as much because you're not going to lose up to 50% of your nitrogen application. So that's one of the purposes for adding the uh, humic acid. Another thing is to possibly add molasses uh, to your nitrogen solution. Uh, and the, the reason for that is, as was discussed earlier, you want to provide some type of soluble carbon 
and it's also a strong biostimulant for the aggressive bacteria that decompose uh, everything that's in the soil that are naturally going to attack that inorganic nitrogen fertilizer that's there. They're going to be looking for carbon, so you want to add some molasses in there with your uh, fertilizer application. <clears throat> Another thing is, is that since we're uh, we're transitioning these soil health systems to these soil health systems. Uh, many times, your uh, the nitrogen that's in that particular system is in the nitrate form. So, one of the things to do to help the biology out is to make sure you have adequate levels of molybdenum uh, in that system because that is an enzyme cofactor for nitrate reductase enzyme, uh, which is needed by the bacteria to convert nitrate into amino acids. So the whole goal uh, behind all of this is to stabilize and then get that nitrogen converted into amino acid as fast as possible so that we don't lose it and it's plant available as the biology is working and it's helping to cycle all those nutrients in that system. So that's some of the stuff that you can start to do, start to learn how to stabilize those uh, fertilizer applications, make them more or less, uh, instead of being inorganic, more organic. Uh, to where it's more friendly with the biology and you're not inhibiting uh, the biological associations that you need to have. Great. Um, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about grazing uh, and, and livestock integration. So Marlon, um, if uh, rotationally grazed animals in a cover crop system uh, are put out there uh, in what's traditionally been a cash cropping field, uh, what what is the likelihood of, of compaction from those animals and what would we have to be required or need to do some remediation with tillage? Uh, what's kind of the management strategy when we, when we put those animals out there? This, this is a great uh, question answer and it starts with it depends. <laughs> I think it depends on your environment. Uh, I've worked with producers uh, and if they've had a, if they're grazing and, and we get a one inch rainstorm, uh, the cattle will pug up the, the soils. So they'll compact it a little bit. But I think the important thing to realize is that compaction, grazing and compaction is generally based on how long the animal is on the ground. In the West, we're kind of lucky because we're dry and cold quite a bit and we can really manage our water through our irrigation. So we, generally don't put cattle on the soil when the ground's wet. And so we do a lot of our cover crop grazing when the ground is dry or when it's frozen. Uh, now that being said, as the soils become stronger, meaning your aggregate is stronger, the, the soil has better weight bearing capacity. Uh, as producers evolve in their knowledge of grazing cover crops, we try to teach them and we learn together that we limit the time that the livestock are on a particular paddock. We try to promote one to three days and move those cattle, get them off that paddock, put them in a new one. How do they do that? They do that with an electric fence. So when we can limit time of impact on that field, in most of those instances, we have not seen very much compaction. Now, if we do have a little bit of compaction, if we're following the principles of soil health and we have good soil biology, and in a lot of the cases that I've worked with producers, if we have good earthworm populations, those earthworms can really drill through the soil and help aerate that soil once again. But it all starts with a good stable aggregate. Great. Doug, in a, in a higher rainfall environment like the uh, producers that you work with, uh, what, what do you recommend and, and uh, work with producers to prevent that compaction from happening? Sure, Steve. Well, you know, kind of like Marlon said, um, this one sure starts off with a, it's depend, it depends. Um, you know, uh, are, are, they in a, are they in a really wet area? Is it a bottomland? Is it an upland? Are they, are they a long-term no-tiller or are they just starting out? Uh, so I, I just tell everybody to be smart about it. Um, you know, if they're just starting out into a no-till situation and they've got cover crops and they want to graze them, you know, that, that soil initially for those first two or three years doesn't have much structure or strength that Marlon mentioned. And so I'm probably going to try to limit 
you know, the grazing that first year or two uh, to, to dry or to frozen times. Um, but, but I think we do have to realize that, that we can't always, always do that. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with folks that had, had uh, cover crops and, and grazing in, in Missouri, Missouri and Mississippi River floodplain fields. Um, and, and so, again, you got to be smart about it. Um, you know, I just had a call the other day. Uh, I had a guy, he was a, he was a long-term, long-term no-tiller. Um, 15 or so years no-till, four, four or five years cover crops, and he called me and uh, uh, we got to talking about grazing his cover crops, and he said he thinks he's just going to graze everything every year. And I said, well, why, why, why is that? And he said, well, because he'd had a, a field that he'd uh, grazed a year ago, and or, or a year and a half ago now, I guess, and by his own admission, really tracked it up way too, way too bad. Um, but he planted soybeans in it and he said that was his best yield of all of his fields. Um, and so I guess I'm not going to say we, we need to go out and purposely track up a field, but I think we do need to understand that if we're smart about it, um, if we've got, you know, good, good cover crops out there, some, some good, uh, aggregate stability, but I just, I don't think there's as much of a, of a problem from livestock compaction as we would as we would typically think. Great, thanks, Doug. Um, all of you have talked about carbon and the value and the importance of carbon for soil health, and and we understand there are various forms of carbon. But Barry, uh, if you would talk to us a little bit about the differences of carbon that we see in rangeland versus row crop row crop land. And if producers change row crop land uh, over to a perennial grazing type of mix, uh, particularly on marginal ground, how does that carbon development occur in a in a what has traditionally been row crop ground versus rangeland? Well, uh, I think in the most recent publication of uh, Nature and Properties of Soils, uh, Dr. Weil did a great job of explaining all the, did a better job really of explaining all the different pools of carbon and pools of organic matter. We, we tend to just think in agriculture, there's this one number on our soil test and we think organic matter is a thing. And uh, what, what that latest uh, textbook that's in most of the college uh, soils courses now uh, did a good job of showing was there's all these different fractions and pools of organic matter and a lot of them are cycling fast a lot of them even liquid forms uh, and and one of the one of the things that we've had as a, a struggle with our cropland is we're able to grow a lot of biomass you know a 250 bushel corn crop produces a lot of biomass and as that gets if that traditionally gets worked into the soil it produces a lot of labile carbon right there in the soil, but it's very, very fragile and, it, and it's very rapid to turn over and we lose it very, very rapidly. So by, by trying to take that system and integrate cover crops, get more roots there more often, we facilitate the, the habitat for more organisms that can produce some of the slower chain reactions, more of the funguses, more of the, more of the, carbon sources and biological organisms producing those labile carbon sources that are longer chain. They're more stable in the environment. They're more protected. We put them inside of organic uh, uh, soil aggregates so they're more protected. Uh, we put them deeper in the soil profile along the rhizosphere so they're more protected. So anytime we can emulate that, that rangeland, that, that prairie, uh, we're going to get those longer chain uh, carbon sources that are far more stable. And if we can, anytime we can stabilize the organic matter in the soil, then, then that's gonna give us resilience and, and, and build a lot more function back into the soil. So I guess in, in the easiest way to explain it is we're moving from a lot of short chain organic matter uh, to a longer chain organic matter and more stable organic matter as we get more of those diverse roots into the soil more of the time. And Stan, Stan's far more, uh, versed on the, the range uh, benefits and, and how, how range is different. Yeah, Stan, you've had a, a, a lot of experience out in the rangeland. What, what would you add to that? 
so I think what uh, what Barry said is is right on the money. And I uh, just recently read a, a research paper kind of related to this. They compared um, uh, native rangeland to uh, conventional till cropland, and then they compared to what they kind of considered degraded, but it was CRP. And uh, the proportions of those those uh, pools of carbon, like Barry was talking about, were kind of uh, mirrored, you know, on the on the grassland what they saw on the cropland, but it was mainly just the overall um, level of carbon, total carbon or total organic carbon and organic matter was was higher on on the on the native rangeland than it was on the cropland. So there actually hasn't been a lot of of research on rangeland about those various uh, pools of carbon, at least from what I could read so far. So, um, but I think the same uh, the same things that Barry talked about happening on cropland are, are also happening on on rangeland when you when you uh, when you change the management and and it affects those. You can track it pretty well with with looking at total carbon though and and organic matter. Um, you can kind of and then if you know how those those different pools are affected, you you know that they're going to be uh, affected similarly, I guess, on rangeland. So. Well, we're going to ask one more question, and we started the, the Q&A off with Doug, and I'm going to end it with Doug. This is a very timely question, uh, and particularly for producers today uh, struggling with markets. Um, what's the number one thing a producer can do that will benefit their soil the most, but still be cost effective when these difficult markets occur and the supply chain is broken as it seems to be uh, these days? Steve, it's probably probably not the answer that most of them would expect, you know, when, it, when they're talking about, you know, production. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing that folks can do to put a few more dollars in their pocket is to, is to market a, a portion of their production um, directly to the consumers. You know, whether that be um, grass-fed beef, uh, pastured eggs, uh, pastured pigs, um, cover crop seed. Um, th there's a whole variety of different uh, things out there. You know, <clears throat> uh, generally about 17% of the consumer's food dollar uh, makes it back to the farmer. 83% of that consumer food dollar goes to shippers and processors and marketers and all of the different middlemen. You know, if, if if each farmer out there would just would just market direct market a portion of their production of their annual production every single year, um, and and we took back part of that eighty three percent of that consumer dollar back to uh, back directly to the to the farmer's pocket. Um, you know how, how many dollars would we add to our to our all of our small communities? Um, it, it just, it's a huge opportunity that I think we're, we're missing out on. Um, we, we become really good at, at producing volume, whether it be, whether it be cattle or, or grain, um, but, but we're wholesale producers. Um, that's a, that's a price, uh, a price taker, not a price maker. And so I think, I think that's where we need to go. Again, you know, there's so many options um, from a soil health standpoint, generally, um, that that uh, direct marketing leads you down a road of, of of diverse cover crops, of diverse animals, diverse livestock, um, maybe even adding diversity um, from a cash crop standpoint. I know a lot of a lot of guys that are that are uh, adding diversity through cover crops that they're growing as a cash crop to to sell to other producers. So a, a, a huge huge opportunity I think that we need to all take a look at is direct marketing. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great uh, suggestion, Doug, and a, and a really good way to, to end this. Uh, we got through less than half of the questions that we that were submitted to us. I uh, want to thank each one of you for taking the time uh, to spend with us today and sharing the knowledge that, that you have. Uh, I will remind our viewers that, that these are uh, resources that are available to you. They work for 
uh, USDA, NRCS, and I think any one of them would be happy to, to answer your questions uh, if you just give them a, a ring or a, an email. And uh, so these are these are some great resources out there. This is not all of the regional soil health specialists that are across the country. There are some others. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to, to look your your closest one up or the one that you think you connect with the best. But uh, again, thanks for no-till on the planes for sharing an hour with us today. And uh, we'll see you down the road. And uh, thanks again, everybody.